everybody, it's Jeff Antoniak and welcome to The Right Note Rule. This is one of our Digging Deeper Jazz videos. So glad you tuned in. As always, this is going to be for all instruments. And this is a pretty ingenious method to help us develop our ears, to help us find those sweet notes that we hear people playing. This is something that was showed to me years ago and I've gotten a lot of traction out of it. And it really supports our talk about voice leading and thirds and sevenths and everything else like that. So I tell you what, let me uh, play a quick little couple courses of B-flat concert blues here for you, unaccompanied, and I hope you can hear the changes in what I'm doing. One, two, a one, two, three. Okay, so I played two choruses. The first one I meant to be a little bit more simpler. The second one I sort of meant to amp things up a little bit. And I still hope that you were able to hear the changes. For those more advanced of you, you could actually probably tell me which blues changes I was using. Was I doing this in this measure? Was I doing a 3625 or a plain five turnaround? All that. The bottom line is I hope you could hear the blues in there. And I was thinking about one specific idea, this right note rule. So let me put this sheet up on the, uh, on the screen for you. And as always, this is a PDF I'd love to send you. So it's a really simple step-by-step -step way to go through and do some self-analysis. So um, we're picking a, I'm using the example of a C blues here. Uh, this will work on many, many, many songs. And this rule, let's, I think it's good about like 70% of the time. 70% is pretty good for a rule. Uh, there's a couple little places where it breaks down or it just doesn't give us a great answer. Let me talk you through it. So the idea is, step one is right on the sheet. Um, first thing is find a place where you don't sound good. Is that gonna be difficult? <laughs> I think most of us have a, a couple tunes or a couple measures in a couple tunes, but that's step one. What are we working on, right? So we want to pick a place where we are not sounding good, where we know we're not making the changes, where our heroes sound better than us, right? So I'm going to use an example of the second measure of the blues. I can tell if someone has it going on when I hear them play the second measure of the blues. That's going to be a place. So we'll select that. So the next thing that we think about is what is the general key of the song? That right there can be kind of tricky because some songs are in three keys, some songs are in 10 different keys, right? Sometimes it's the key of the moment, but the key of the song. So for the blues, it's actually a little tricky. This is a C blues as the example, but it's a C dominant seventh tonality. So this may be a little blurry for some of you. Um, that's something we'll talk about later, okay? So now the third item that we look at, we've identified which chord we're looking at. Let's call it the second measure of the blues. So now I want you to, determine what is the third and seventh of that chord. So of course we have to have this background knowledge. Do you know your thirds and sevenths? Great, okay. So in this instance, we're talking about an F7. What is the third and the seventh of an F7? A is the third, E flat is the flat seven, right? And so now the next step, item number four on our checklist here, which of those two notes is not in the key of C or C dominant seventh is an A in the key of C? The answer is yeah, it's in the scale. Is an E flat in the key of C or C dominant seventh? The answer is no, it's an E natural. The E flat is not. So my point, going through it very quickly, on that F7 in the second measure, you have to play an E flat in that measure if you want to give the sound of that chord, if you want to nail that chord. So that sound of an E flat in a C blues, if I play I played C, E, G, E, then I played an E flat when I got to the second measure. That really gave the sound of that chord. And that's the process. Identify what you want to work on. So that right there is huge, huge for a lot of us. 
is identify what muscle group when you're working out. What are you working out? Are you just going to leap around the room and hope you get fit? Probably won't work, right? You identify what you want to work on, which measure. Then we determine the key of the song, sort of what's, what's the zone of our tonality. Then we determine on that chord that's kicking your butt, what's the third and the seventh. Third and the seventh are such important foundational functional notes. That's why we pick the third and the seventh. Which of those is not in the key of the song? So you may think we would want to stay in the key. Well, and we can do that. That's a nice diatonic approach, a melodic approach. But we we were talking about, you know, our issue here is what chord am I not getting? Where am I not nailing the sound of a chord? This will help you do that. So I'm saying in that second measure, I need to hear an E flat if you want me to know you're playing an F7. Are there other ways to do it? Are there other sneaky ways to do it that some of the greats have figured out? Yeah, there are. But I tell you what, nine out of 10 times, we're gonna hear our heroes. We're gonna hear Sonny Rollins and we're gonna hear Pat Metheny and we're gonna hear on and on nailing that note in that measure. Okay, that's a really big deal. And actually, let me just pause this whole thing for a second and tell you guys or remind you guys about jazzwire.net. That is a website that's coming up very soon, early 2018. Of course, depends when you see this video. It may have existed for a year by now. But jazzwire.net is going to be a fantastic place to get more personalized information on this. Tons of great ideas, but a place to meet other great adult amateur musicians, who many of you are, and... Uh, and, you know, get to know each other. People that want to get to that semi-pro level. So anyway, check out jazzwire.net and there's going to be so much more information like this on there. Okay, let's go back to the sheet. I'll put it back on the screen. Another example, let's look at the eighth measure of this C blues. So many more basic C blues would just have another C7 in the seventh measure as written and then in the eighth measure. Well, in a more bebop kind of blues, we would put that A7 there. We could talk about why that is another time. I think I've done it on a previous video. So now, let's say you run across that change, whether you know why it's there or not. So what, so we've identified the measure, eighth measure is kicking my butt, or man, I hear Clifford Brown doing something in that eighth measure that I'm not doing. Okay, item number one, we've uh, identified the issue. Item number two, what's the key of the song? Well, we're still in C, right? Item number three, what's the third and the seventh of an A7? So you know, it's a C sharp as the third, a G natural. Now, item number four, which of those two is not in the key of C? Is C sharp in the key of C? The answer is no. So there you go. In that eighth measure, you have to play a C sharp if you want to nail the sound of that chord. Let me play a blues. A one, two, three. the sound of that C sharp. It took us out of the key. It carved a sharp corner. It made an edge. Whoa, what is that C sharp doing here? Ah, and then when you get to the next measure. So people ask me all kinds of questions. Well, does it matter where in the measure you play? Yeah, there's better and worse ways to do it, but if you play it anywhere in the measure, it's going to sound fantastic. And yeah, if you resolve it really nicely, it'll sound better. But here's the thing, play the note in the worst place with no resolution. It's really going to work. It's going to work. That's why this is such an ingenious thing. And, and let me give you the last example here on the sheet. I'll put it back up on the screen. And so if we look at uh, three measures from the end and one measure from the end, we have the five chord in our C blues, a G7, right? And in this instance, and now this is a place where I hear a lot of people BSing as they're playing through the blues. They're not carving that change again, that tension release, the 5-1, where the people are sort of playing through it. They're faking it, okay? Okay, I don't mind a little fake in every once in a while. I don't mind great melodic playing. I don't mind using the blues scale or the minor pentatonic scale. But at some point, can you play the changes? That's what jazz musicians do, right? So in those two measures, we've identified, wow, this G7 is kicking my butt. Jeff yelled at me about my G7 on the blues. Okay. Got it. Item number two, what's the third and the seventh? Or the next item, right? Third and the seventh of a G7 is a B natural and an F natural. Which of those two is not in the key of C? Here's where it gets a bit tricky. 
in a C major scale, it has both those notes. There's no right answer, right? So here's the thing, the tonality of a blues is technically a dominant seven tonality. We're not in the key of C major, we're in the key of C7. So technically our, our key signature has a B flat in it. So that B natural of the G7 is the note we want to get, that B natural. Now, a lot of you are going, oh man, that's just voice leading, or those are just leading tones, or et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that's what it is, right? This is another way of thinking about great voice leading. This is another great way of thinking about like 400 years old functional tonality. So at, at some point, um, all these things become sort of the same. Oh, enclosures are just a half step. Yeah, all this information ends up becoming very similar. So. To begin with, that's a drag because it's so confusing. Oh God, I can't remember which version of the whatever. And someone said it's like enclosures, but this is only one note. It gets very confusing. So yeah, don't try to figure that out. As you get more of this information in your head, you begin to see, oh, I understand that these 10 things are really addressing one idea, which is leading tones or sevenths resolving to thirds or things like that, right? So. Don't worry about tying this together with the other stuff you know. Just give this exercise a try. The right note rule. I would love to send you the PDF. So write me at diggingdeeperjazz at gmail.com and um, let you know about this. Also, if you go down to the show notes, um, I'd love for you to sign up for more information about jazzwire.net. We are building this thing right now and it's going to be launching soon. So I would love to send you information when the time comes. So please let us know where you're at if you'd like more information. Easy enough to do, no obligation. Um, and you know, the last thing, just given the timing of where we're at in the year, uh, are you going to be at the Gen Conference in Dallas in 2018? I'm going to be uh, presenting there my ideas on jazz teacher training and getting jazz pros like some of you out there working, doing the kind of work I do and starting a business like I have, working with all the great adult amateurs out there. So if you're going to be at the Gen Conference in uh, early January 2018, I hope I see you there. I hope I see you at the presentation I'm doing. I'm also going to be at the Saxophone Symposium, the International Saxophone Symposium, symposium uh, in uh, D.C in uh, also early January 2018. So a couple places I would love to meet you in person and talk to you. So anyway, you get the idea about the right note rule. Give this a try. Now here's the thing. I said it works about 70% of the time. There are instances where it's not immediately obvious and that gets interesting. We're not going to get into it today. There are times when it's like if we're playing giant steps like what key is this song in? I've gone through three keys and I'm only three measures into the tune. Okay, so it, it, it takes a little bit of parsing, it takes a little bit of knowledge about knowing, well, what key of the, you know, people call it the key of the moment. In these four measures, what key are we in? That can be a way to think about it. But this is a powerful exercise. And as a younger player, this helped me a ton. But the bottom line is I think about this idea more and more as I'm trying to play and that ability to look at a pile of chord changes and I can see the one chord change that stands out and I can see the one or two notes in that chord change that stand out to let me know, oh, that's probably gonna be the money note. So that's an intellectual approach, of course. We also develop our ears to be able to hear a chord and go, ah, I think that note's gonna sound beautiful, right? So for some of us, we start off with the intellectual approach. That tends to be me more. Uh, I've developed my ears over the years, but we're all coming from different places. So I hope this tool is uh, a good one for you. I hope it's powerful for you. As always, I want to thank Gonzalez Reads, who are a fantastic sponsor of these videos. That's what I'm playing here. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please write me at diggingdeeperjazz at gmail.com. I'd love to send you this PDF or any of the others. Thank you so much for tuning in, and uh, I hope I'll be seeing you soon. Take care.